Good evening, everybody. On behalf of CAHO, I welcome uh, each and everyone here and all the participants for this wonderful, the fifth, uh, the fifth chapter we are doing, uh, uh, which is on uh, hospital infection control. We have the one of the most prominent person in India, I think, on microbiology. She's Dr. Yes, J. J. Lakshmi. And uh, she's at, uh, she heads uh, the KMCH Department of Microbiology. And she's, uh, she had served in PSG and other institutes before. But she's very popular among her students because uh, she's had a very good experience in teaching for both undergraduate and graduate students. She's won many prestigious awards like JC Patel and BC Mehta gold medal. And she, in, I think uh, even in our CAHO when we had a CPQIH or CPQIC, she is there to talk excellently, make it very simple, even for a person who really doesn't know much, anything about infection control, she is there to talk to them. And uh, she has um, you know, a lot of international and national publications and has chaptered a few, uh, I mean, written a few uh, chapters and books. And she's a very, very integral part of CAHO. And she was the editor of CAHO newsletter. And also she won the most uh, best platform presentation award in 2018. And her focus is really on how to improve the quality, especially on infection control in the in healthcare organizations. And we're very, very happy she's able to spend her one hour with us. And at the end of it, all you can post your questions at um, Q and A, and definitely she's there to answer for you. The floor is now yours, Jaya. Jaya uh -huh, thank you so very much for those excellent words, ma'am. It was very, very encouraging. Right. It's very, very nice to hear also from you. And, um, Thank you all dear participants for connecting so early on time and uh, to start the session. This is going to be a very, very simple uh, session on, on uh, implementing um, NABH entry level standards in, in the series that we are having now, which is the, um, uh, the pre-accreditation entry level standards for HCOs and SHCOs. And we've done four uh, earlier. This is going to be the fifth one because this is the fifth chapter, but according to me, I would say this is one of the most, most important um, in any healthcare facility where you don't want any patient coming to you, go back with another that they did not come with and uh, uh, making it very difficult for us. And, you know, uh, but thanks to COVID, a lot of things have been learned uh, during uh, the COVID pandemic, the last two years, we've learned so much of um, infection prevention and control and a lot of, a uh, uh, lot of, uh, uh, informal um, uh, I mean, the specialists are around who have um, uh, who have tried to learn and master as well. So I'm just going to take you through uh, the HIC standard, which is the fifth chapter. Now, if you look at this particular chapter, this is the uh, I'm going to this is a summary of the standards here. You have three standards and thirteen objective elements. It's easy to remember the two ends of the arms, which is HIC one and three has five objective elements each, and the HIC2 has um, three objective elements. These objective elements are something that you can, you know, you can measure. Sometimes in certain of the accreditation processes, they would also call these as measurable elements. So it's easy because you can give them numbers. And when you give numbers, it's easy for us to say where we are now and where we need to be. So that score would help us. And these are the objective elements and that we need to keep in mind. And today we're not going to look at what is the infection control and how are you going to do this? But you've got to just look at what does these standards require and what does this accreditation process would want us to do in this particular you know, standard and objective element. Now, if you look at the intent of this particular chapter, it, it quickly looks at effective infection control program. Any program is live, okay? So is the infection control program just very live and live program. So whatever you're capturing today, uh, would help you to have a better tomorrow. So your the uh, the capture has to be perfect or good at least, as close to robust as it can be, so that you can plan for your future. 
Okay, so the your next year's program is going to be based on all that you went through, all the experience that you had, and all the surveillance activities that you had done and captured uh, the numbers which you are translating into uh, translating into an action point for the next year. So this is very very important. So we need to have an effective infection control program which would look at reducing and eliminating. Reducing means from higher number to lower number. Eliminating means completely removing them for both for all three categories of people, patients, visitors, and providers of care, okay? And it also looks at measuring all the measures and actions that you would take to prevent or reduce the risk of hospital-acquired infection. Of course, um, I'm sure all of us have, have some experience of the outbreaks and action plan to control outbreaks. Uh, I'm sure many of us have uh, um, you know, experience during COVID and many more uh, even while handling the other infections earlier than the COVID. Right. Now let's look at the HIC one, which is the which is the first standard of this chapter. It says the hospital has an infection control manual, which is periodically updated and conducts surveillance activities. If you look at the standard, it says the manual has to be there, and this manual need to be periodically updated, which means it need to be reviewed, added to what is new and what is applicable as of today, and then so that you the your entire hospital follows this for the next one year. And if there would be any change to this, there would be an amendment which you need to incorporate. And it also says you conduct surveillance activity. Surveillance means going around looking for clues and evidence to see what is actually happening. What is that actually currently happening? And then you, you would want to capture that. Okay, so this is what this particular standard is. But if you look at the objective element, it looks like as, as if they are not so very connected, but this is what needs to be there written down in the manuals as well. One, HIC 1E looks at it focuses on adherence to standard precautions at all times. HIC 1B, which looks at cleanliness and general hygiene of facilities will be maintained and monitored. When it says maintained and monitored, please note these words. When it says maintained, that means you need to do it. Monitored means there is somebody actually looking at it and seeing whether it has been done the way you have written it and way you have conducted it. Okay, HIC-1C looks at cleaning and disinfection practices are defined. That means you are telling which one will be cleaned with what, in what concentration, what, how often. That is what is this cleaning and disinfection practices that is defined and it is monitored. Once you have defined this, this particular material would be cleaned or this particular surface will be cleaned with this particular disinfectant solution and this concentration and percentage, then you would you need to monitor and see whether it is happening. Wherever it says monitor, again, it needs to be looked at very critically. It's good to have a checklist to see and see whether it is working. HIC 1D looks at equipment cleaning, disinfection and sterilization practices are included. So it, it needs to include this, this cleaning, uh, cleaning, disinfection and sterilization of instruments and equipment that's used in the hospital, which is very much looking at the activities within a CSST. HIC 1E looks at linen and laundry man management processes are included. It should include how are you going to clean, how are you going to decontaminate your, um, your or um, handle your dry and the wet linen uh, in the hospital and how are you going to bring it back into use. So this is what your uh, HIC 1E looks at, right? So when you, when you see uh, this, you need to know that there is a program and this program will always have a committee. Of course, the standards here or the objective elements does not clearly describe in the HIC chapter, but definitely it is a requirement, right? So when you look at the, um, um, the committees that are there, that means you have a, a team of members who sit and discuss about this and bring about action points for the next. And this would be executed on an every day or twenty um, on day to day basis by the infection control team. So you have a committee which is like an advisory body and the team which is like an executive body which executes. So there is a team that advises. You have the management representative, you have the the heads of the clinical departments which have handled infections, the nursing team, the infection control officer, the infection control nurse, the heads of or the uh, in charges of the CSST, the pharmacy, um, the housekeeping, the and the ICUs, etc. 
Of course, you need to have a secretary, you know, HIC secretary. Okay, so now please understand this entry level standards would have lesser standards and objective elements compared to that of the full standards of fifth edition. However, this entry level should have the most important component, so whether it is a 10 bedded hospital or a thousand bedded hospital, it needs to have certain elements for sure. Right. So even if it is few bedded hospital only, you need to have a committee and a team. So you need to have few members who may be part of another committee also. Right. It's not that they have to be exclusively part of this committee. Yes. It's if it's a larger facility, even a thousand bedded hospital can go for an entry level accreditation. So at that time, it, it is okay to have multiple teams um, there. But if it's a smaller facility, you could have the team members being you know, shared in various committees, but however, the action is what is required to be fulfilled. Okay, so for every program, so you structure down what is the program that you would do for your hospital, because this program is going to be very unique, depending on the type of hospital, you know, it, the type of infections that you encounter, the geographical locations that you have, the number of healthcare workers you handle, number of patients that you load, patient load that you handle. So the program would be very, very different. For example, let me give you of an ophthal hospital would have an infection control program much different to that of an uh, obstetric hospital or an ortho hospital. A single speciality or multi-speciality would have a different program. A rural to an urban to a corporate to a teaching to a district hospital, each one has its own. So you need to tailor the program. Okay, and then have the committee and the team defined. Right. Now, looking at the manual, of course, this is not an objective element, but that is what you need to have. Uh, um, you know, you, you need to have an apex manual and then an infection control manual, which is important for the for the hospital to have. Now, if you look at the HIC manual, you can prepare the manual looking at another for, you know, as a reference, but it's good to go through and, and prepare a simplified manual. I always say it should be something like a recipe book where, you know, uh, somebody says, this is how you make a particular dish. You write it systematically in a simple language that the person who reads understand. If, suppose it's a mother giving to the daughter at the time of marriage. So simple, very simply written in the language that they can understand. And then they start, they give instructions and specific key points where you did, they have to be very critical. And then you get the dish there. So, and I also give this, uh, I love to give this this example when, when you taste, whoever prepares the dish, taste and see, and then, yeah, it's tasting good. That's an internal audit. When you have a guest coming home and then he or she tastes the uh, food that you that you prepared and they say, oh, wow, this is fantastic. And that's your external audit. Okay, so this is as simple as that. So your manual should write down clearly what you require to do. And you follow whatever is written down in your manual. And whenever there is a change, you just... You just go about seeing what you need to do in the uh, manual as an amendment. For example, nobody um, thought there would be a change or a revision coming to the biomedical waste rule in 2016 in March. So when it comes in, it is important for you to adhere. So you need to incorporate that into your manual. So therefore, it becomes added. Sometimes you whatever was outsourced earlier now becomes part of your activity within your hospital and that becomes part of your manual. So you need to look at it as amendments through the time. But once in a year, it's a good practice to review the entire content and see if there are no changes you can discuss in your meeting and say no change or make those changes and then you follow. I'm just giving you an example of the manual. Uh, this is from CMC Valor with permission being taken and this is the manual picture alone just to show right um, how these manuals should look at. This is the seventh edition which was released in 2018 and this is the hospital infection control manual. This is also to say you could have it controlled you need to have, um, you know, in the um, the persons, you know, identify the persons who prepared and approved it for use and um, where it is in circulation. And if it's obsolete, not in use, it has to be removed from the system. So these are important for a manual. Now, these manuals should have those five important areas. Additionally, all that could be there because the entry level does not focus on surveillance of healthcare associated infection in great strength, does not look at antibiotic policy in in, in much as a, as a requirement because there may be a small facility which may be, um, you know, finding it difficult to do um, the um, antibiotic policy or the surveillance completely. So it is, it is not made mandate in this particular 
particular um, uh, requirement of the standard. So, but if the hospital has, they could add them. But these are the important requirements that should be there. So one is on standard precautions. Now, what standard precaution? Infection prevention practices that apply to all patients, regardless of whether you have a suspected or confirmed infection status in any settings in which healthcare is delivered. Right. So you wear a mask and you don't know whether the person whom you encounter as uh, has um, uh, SARS-CoV or not, but you protect yours, you wear it, considering that everybody is infectious at one point of time. So similarly, in a hospital setting, you don't look at the person um, that you uh, are going to uh, handle, but you're going to look at the process or procedure you're going to do. Accordingly, you will wear appropriate the protectives, protective gears. So there are various components to the standard precautions. And I'm sure for this audience, it may be you're already very aware of them. Just quickly uh, taking them down. One is your hand hygiene, which is the most, most important. The other is PPE, all your gloves, your cap mask, uh, you know, apron, um, your boot, all of these, and the visors um, and the respirators, all of these. And then your respiratory etiquette, prevention of needle stick injury and injury from other sharp items, pre and post exposure prophylaxis, environmental cleaning, patient care equipment cleaning, linen and laundry management, safe disposal of biomedical waste. Of course, there is not much emphasis into into transmission-based precaution, but it is good and to know uh, the transmission-based precautions where you, you know, um, um, you uh, isolate patients based on the type of infections and the way they could transmit it. So you have an airborne precaution or a contact precautions or a droplet precautions, depending on whether it's a tuberculosis or an MRC patients or a COVID or an influenza patients. So you have, uh, ident you identify and have, and follow the uh, required norms right so in the in in the same of the standard this the second um, objective element hic 11 b looks at environmental cleaning so it looks at how clean is the environment within the hospital the cleanliness is what it is looking at so it also looks at whether you there is a differentiation to the practice of cleaning in a uh, in a non-clinical area to that of a clinical area and whether the healthcare workers are aware of the same or the housekeeping staff or the persons designated to do such a practice are aware. It looks at all healthcare professionals should adopt appropriate procedures for routine cleaning of different areas of the uh, hospital and those which are frequently touched surfaces. So that's what this would this um, particular um, objective element looks at. It will, you know, it, it's important to teach and train our staff how to clean the. So the, you, you should you should never allow them to use a broom to um, you know sway on both sides by directional cleaning would not be accepted. But what is ideal to do is a unidirectional way of swaying the sweep sweep to remove um, the the gross dust. But dry dusting never never allow within the hospital, right? So you also need to look at and teach and train on how they are going to clean, where is the focus of cleaning and cleaning activity written down in the manual again, where you would say patient is in the center of the action. So the cleanest would be where you start from to and then go to the areas which are more dirtier. So you start from the cleaner most area to the dirty area and never the reverse. Okay, so here patient and patient cords are the most important. You need to have the distances maintained between the cords and then cleaning starts from the from between patient uh, between patient cords at the far end of the room and comes to the center and then comes out through the door. So this is how a cleaning in rooms would occur, right? So for the areas, sorry, sorry. in a in a theater, the action is in the center of the theater in the OT table. So you start your cleaning from the center of the theater, some center of the um, uh, OT start, and then go to the back end of the OT, then clean on the sides, then in the front, and then you come out. So this is how it needs to be clean, and that is how we need to teach our staff to clean. So when they're mopping, it's important that they mop not like a zigzag. You would see, you know, it, it, it's interesting. You should watch this happen in your hospitals as well. So there would be a zigzag there and you would have gaps in between which are not clean. So you need to teach them, you know, in a stroke of eight cleaning to mop these sites. And it is important, of course, to monitor because you remember that it said 
it is maintained and it is monitored. Whenever there is monitoring, that means there need to be some kind of documentation of these activities being done. So you look at the work, the schedules. So the cleaning in any hospital is based on the risk stratification matrix that you prepare. It's because the cleaning would be very different in a in a entry point of the hospital, in a common reception area, to the OPDs, to the wards, to the ICUs, in the theater, etc. So the cleaning is going to be very different. The type of material that is used to clean is going to be very different. The composition or the concentrations in which they are going to be used is going to be very different. The persons who are going to be doing may also be very different. So it's important that you document what is being used. It's good also a practice to color code your, your cleaning equipment so that you don't um, mix the mix them up. You know, you don't use those used for the restrooms to be used in the in a in a clinical area, etc. So you also um, you know, color code them so that you have appropriate cleaning material used in these areas. So whether you brush the floor, uh, mop, dust, toilet wash, or uh, you know um, basins clean, uh, liquids are refilled, tiles are clean, lights and fans are clean, doors are clean, windows clean, waste collected, bins collected. It also requires the person who is doing it. So somebody supervises this activity and documents, and somebody there in the ward also. So I always ensure that the ICNs um, go around and have a look at it, and then see whether it has been done as often. And I, I used to just look at it once a week and then later. Sometimes you will see that even before the activity, they would just tick everything. It's like a tick list, never a checklist. So it's good to do once in a while to see that people are doing what they, what has been recommended to do and what has been trained and taught to them to do. Okay, then is the, um, the HIC 1C, which looks at cleaning patient care equipment. Every patient need to have an equipment as clean as it was to uh, the you know to the first one to the next one. Also, it also for the same patient between two different users, they need to be clean as appropriately. Okay, and this is based on the degree of risk involved in you know in, uh, with the instrument, whether it, the equipment, whether it is coming in contact with the skin or the mucous membrane, or it's going to touch the the blood and body fluids or the tissues inside. So accordingly, you choose either to disinfect them or you choose to use a sterilant or you sterilize them, right? So this is about the patient care um, equipment that you would look at. Also important to see what these sur surfaces and, and look at them and see what is the frequency of cleaning that's required. In most hospitals, we will have a schedule for cleaning the rooms the walls, etc. So there is somebody coming, mopping the area, write it and go. But what is getting missed out in these areas are the high touch surfaces. The high touch points are the ones which are going to be the higher risk for, which has a higher risk for transmitting infection to the patient who is there and across to all the healthcare workers. So you need to focus on the high risk or, or high, sorry, high touch points, you know, um, and then you have a, a, a focused activity of cleaning these high touch points. So it's important to recognize which are these high touch points. Right. So it's also a good practice to walk through the process. And I love to do that. So you, whenever there is an activity, it's good to go and see what is happening in each of these areas. So and you note down and then come back and then structure a process for this. That would be an easy way of doing rather than having a structure and trying to fit into and into a system where it may not happen. So it's always good to walk through the process. Either you have um, a camera, um, you know, captured a, a activity or you can just go by yourself into all of these process, uh, entire process of what's happening and then through the 24 hours and then you can take it because the activities are going to be so different in the day to the night. Okay, so the risk of infection that are associated with these areas and what are the vulnerabilities these patients would have. So that is how you would see. High touch points is the area that you need to focus more. These are some areas that's been identified as the high touch points here. So the door knobs, which is frequently touched and you will see the housekeeping staff squeeze their mops and then they will open the door knobs. So it's a good practice that I always say wear you know, gloves in one hand so that you know your gloved hand you know, you are uh, using your material and you're using the other hand, which is free to write down or to open up, etc. Or you have a supervisory staff who helps you with 
uh, these things. The other is your bed railings, the patient, the patient's attendant touches, the consultant would touch, and you know, everybody touches, the patient coughs and then touches this to get up, etc. The, the, the lift keys, okay, and all of these points, the, um, the computer keys, the phones that are placed within the facility, you know, the monitors, the surface of the monitors, these are the high touch points. So you need to have to focus these and have an identified disinfectant, a process of cleaning and decontaminating these sites and documenting this better. Okay, the low touch are the floors and the walls and the negligible transmission of infection with these. Okay, so it's only that it aesthetically looks good and it reduces, definitely reduces the load of infection that settles down after some time. Because when you walk, there is a turbulence, it raises up to five feet and come down to fall. So you can clean them up. So that's, that is what, so focus has to be shifted to the high touch points more than these low touch. Also important is the staff aware of the spill management kit that's been available to them. Okay, so they need to know where the kits are, what are the contents of the kit, and when are they going to use. It's also possible that you can have a single kit uh, placed where you call Code Orange and the, entire, the team comes in to handle the spillage. But it's also <clears throat> good practice that everybody aware, is aware whoever created the spill will be responsible for handling it. And they know exactly where the spill kit is and you will know the contents of the spill kit. It's important as the area to focus is you wear the PPE and mark your area or you identify so that somebody is cautioned saying that there is a spill here. And then, you know, you prepare freshly um, sodium um, hypochlorite solution, a one person solution, okay, freshly prepared. And then you you cover the, the spill and then pour the, the solution from outside to inside or an outer to inner, never from inner to outer. And then you, um, you allow it to be there for 20 minutes. And then with the gloved hand, you scoop and take them with a brush and then put it into the biomedical waste uh, you know, bag that is present and then tag them. And this is an incident that you need to document as well. So, and everybody who's routinely handling this, um, the, the housekeeping staff particularly, who's handling these uh, spills and uh, decontamination process need to be, you know, mocked um, to see whether they are doing exactly what they are supposed to be doing. Because that's one, one activity that will be captured also when an assessor comes on site to see whether the staff is aware of the same. Right, and if it's if your sodium hypochlorite is a is a is a tablet, it's easy because you need to just put the n number of tablet to the volume that you require, which is marked on the bottle or a container, and then freshly prepare and add it. If it's going to be a concentrated sodium hypochlorite solution, then you're going to be preparing it and add water only at the time of uh, the um, process of decontamination, so that could be handled. Right, so this is important, and if you're going to use the sodium hypochlorite that's already prepared, it's it's a very very good practice that you you check whether the contents are there in all of these kits um, at a regular time right this is how you handle so it's important that you wear the pps okay use one person sodium sodium hypochlorite so you need to identify when you have a spill larger sometimes in the laboratories also could be in the labor rooms or areas where you could have a blood spill more than 10 ml then it would it would come into the category of a large spill. So here, you need not use just the 1% sodium hypochlorate. In fact, if you look at Kayakal guidelines, it would say 10% sodium hypochlorate to be used, but you can use an intermediate level disinfectant, okay, for the time allocated for its contact time is good enough for it. So for sodium hypochlorate, 1%, it's 20 minutes. Sometimes when you're using an in, um, intermediate disinfectant solution, so then you can use um, you know, you can you can keep it for five to ten minutes also. So that's dependent on the potency of the disinfectant solution that you're using. It's important also to see what type of a surface that is. Okay, whether it is compatible or not. So on a metallic surface, don't never ever use sodium hypochlorite solution. And please teach and train all staff concerned on how to prepare sodium hypochlorite solution, and that has to be um, monitored. So this is a safety check whenever there is a cleaning. This is a very general safety. Of course, also would be for um, blood or body fluid spillage, where you would put a caution, not as a wet floor, but of course, caution blood spillage here. Okay. Periodic training of healthcare workers is very, very important, specifically the housekeeping staff. Um, I would always say that the number of times you train your healthcare workers or your specifically uh, in the language that they understand 
better and in, in demonstrating more to them if they don't understand um, the, you know, in, in continuous language of a session or a discussion or a training with, um, you know, wonderful slides. So it's good to show them and you can have champions within your, your housekeeping team itself who's, who does very well. You can even capture videos of them and then put it up more frequently, at least even for the ones who are joining you at your facility. So it's, it's a good practice to train them more, more often. And um, because uh, recommendations would say, I mean, uh, it, it, I mean, not recommendation. The the standard would say at least once a year of training is enough. But I would say the more frequent, the better it would be. And um, I'm very very thankful to the trainings that we conducted so many years continuously every every month. Um, you know, breaking the batches into two and conducting. So so currently, whoever is handling is. Is, is, is sustaining that practice still, and I'm very, very happy for that. Also important to look at the rodents and pest control, of course. Um, uh, why should this come, come, come under this infection control practices? So um, it just additionally to your infection control practice, it's also good to do, but it does not come under a clause of an objective element, but it's a good practice to uh, look at. And you have somebody, um, you know, you have some contract with some pest control agencies who would visit the facilities to specifically see and um, and uh, and um, um, you know institute measures to reduce the rodents and other pests in the place. Now, again, for this audience, I don't think it's really um, um, really a need for telling what is a disinfection. But however, uh, these are chemicals which can kill most microorganisms, but may not kill the spores but if they did the chemical is able to kill the spores you call them as sterilant okay there you have to identify based on the the based on its utility the type of uh, disinfectant solution its concentration and frequency of use for different um, you know environmental surfaces and instruments or material need to be determined so if you remember the the, the objective elements very clearly said that you need to identify or define define the the disinfection factors and you have to monitor it which means you have to say how are you going to clean your bed pants how are you going to clean your ventilator monitors so you have to write them down and then tell how what are you going to use in what concentrations and how often or it's also good to say who's going to do that also now how do you dis how do you select a disinfectant agent uh, disinfection agent Okay, it is uh, it is usually defined it's selected based on a few criteria, which is based on the intended use and appropriateness. Okay, and degree of disinfection required. You want it to be absolutely sterile. You house it. What is that you're requiring in this particular area? If it's a floor or it's a, it's a toilet, it's along with the organic material that is there in the toilet, or it could be just a load of microorganisms along with the dust there, or an instrument which is frequently touched with more of your microorganisms, etc. It's also good to follow your spaldings classification based on the risk that with these instruments that you would have. So accordingly, so where do they come in contact? Do they come in contact with the skin or the mucous membrane or does it touch the, you know, the blood and body fluids or the tissues inside? So accordingly, you choose a low or intermediate level of disinfection when it's coming in contact with the skin. When it is coming to the mucous membranes, you look at higher level disinfectant. And when it comes to blood and tissues, you are going to look at something which is a sterilizing agent or a sterilizer, right? You also looked at the safety, okay? And compatibility that it has with the material. Like I mentioned to you, if you use sodium hypochlorite on a, on a, on a stainless steel surface, they're gonna corrode. I'm sure a lot of people during the COVID times have used sodium hypochlorite as, uh, for a decontamination. Um, as, as per the recommendations, of course, you can use a sodium hypochlorite or, a, or an alcohol. That was the common um, recommendation, which is a very simple one for all facilities to follow. That was a very good recommendation. However, it also clearly mentioned not to use on, on steel. But, you know, a lot of um, uh, facilities now have rusted the instruments and trolleys because, um, you know, over use of the sodium alcohol. So it's, so it's important to look at the compatibility as well and safety for the persons who use uh, them. And also the turnaround time. How early do you want this material to be availability? How early do you want the surface to be decontaminated, etc.? Right? So this is the HIC-1D, which looks at the CSST activity. Okay, clearly it says um, how the CSST should be there. So it, it, it looks at what are the do's and don'ts in the CSST. CSST should be in an area which is 
uh, accessible to the activity but should be away from you know the routine uh, routine of the patient care or traffic of the personals etc okay so and it needs to have this unidirectional flow unidirectional flow where you have the contaminated material coming into the dirty area then it gets clean it's inspected and you know disinfected inspected and you know packed and then sterilized and then um, you know stored until it is issued at the counters for various clinical areas of the hospital including the theater you might have um, um, a lift that's bringing them down and taking these material also you could have the 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 contaminate sorry the soiled instruments coming down and the sterilized instrument shifted up so it's important to check whether the the uh, lips that bring them or the dumb waiters that bring them and are clean so that you know um, the and 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 pretty much sterile for your material to be transferred okay and uh, using appropriate methods of sterilization you know in instruments that are calibrated by personals who are trained to do so wearing appropriate protectives and they know the safety precautions of each one of them right and uh, also using um, quality indicators indicators for checking or to validate validating validating the sterilization process because you can't visually see okay this is sterilized and not um, when the instruments have gone through the process so you need to stick up something which changes color or you have gone through a process there is a time temperature and pressure which gives you or um, or not not or ideally yes once every day is what would be the best to do or at least once a week that you use a biological indicator an appropriate biological indicator which is which is processed after the um, after the decon um, after the sterilization process you also you also um, reclaim it you know um, by appropriate temper for example a geobacillus stereothermophilus would require um, an incubator which is at set at 50 60 degrees centigrade so many times you will see people using the biological indicator putting at 37 and say ma'am it's passed so it's not just that so you have to look at what is specific and then document them okay this gone or passed through and then check and verify so it is important that you document your entire activity if you have more than one sterilizer sterilizer you also need to know which day which batch which sterilizer was this entire material uh, sterilized what all went into this why would is that matter because if there would be any one instrument that had failed or shows any um, you know Uh, no change in color in the chemical indicator or later you know if you are using a older method of um, or of uh, checking up your biological indicators you find that they are not um, they've not passed uh, a day later then you have to re recall all your instruments so it's important that you document all of them properly so that's important okay and where you store has to be appropriate as well it has to be in a stainless steel rack okay it's about 40 to 45 cm from the top because you will have the on the roof you can have fungal colonization and that may come into your material so you need to be below the roof and above also from the floor because if you are mopping if you are cleaning people are walking it should not be touching so at least 20 to 25 cm above the floor and at least 5 cm away from the wall so this is a basic simple requirement you will require for your instruments which are which are stored and packed and after sterilization and ready for issue okay so those are the do's don't never stack your instruments in washers or for sterilizer because they will not penetrate adequately enough and if you see the outside part of it you think it's all okay the other thing is use the flash sterilizer whenever you using an implant certain hospitals would have implants sterilization of implants never to be done in a flash sterilizer and any batch that has an implant being now sterilize that batch even if you've done the previous day you have added one biological indicator you need to put a biological indicator in the batch in which you will have your your uh, implants being sterilized so this these are very very simple things but you need to follow them very carefully so that's this is about cssd right okay there is something about as a um, um, identifying the self shelf life of the sterilized material so it so much depends on what sterilization process that you are doing and also what is the packing material that you have used 
then accordingly and if you have validated the process in your own settings and seen that they are you know they are remaining sterile for n number of days that's the best way to go ahead and identifying a date and it is good to see whether your expiry dates are, are captured on the on the material and you are not using or keeping any of these material which are beyond expiry in any clinical area in the hospital so that's important then is the dirty linen used dirty linens um, you know you need to have them sorted you know um, and transported in identified uh, um, you know hampers where you don't create lot of uh, turbulence by you know sh uh, you know shaking them or or uh, whisking them etc you need to just fold them roll them and then teach and train people on how to um, you know get your linens from the clinical areas and just segregate them it's simple to segregate as dirty and um, and soiled and infected infected is when you have blood body fluids uh, being there and you have some patients with known infections there okay so you have those with blood and body fluid as soil those with infected coming from patients you have identified however they together would come under wet linen and the other would come as a dry linen so for your wet linen you need to decontaminate them with you know 1% sodium hypochlorite for minimum of 20 minutes before you launder them uh, or put them in the your uh, your washing machines so you can also do a heat uh, process of uh, heat uh, decontamination process if you're using a 65 degree centigrade temperature you need to keep at least for 10 minutes if it's 70 to 71 degrees centigrade at least a minimum of three minutes so higher the temperature lesser is the time that's all you require so that also is possible why because if you keep your your material or um, your um, your linen in sodium hypochlorite for long they will leave holes of them okay so that's it so now what what is that you need to document your apex manual would have standard precaution house, housekeeping protocols cleaning disinfection sterilization protocols and linen and laundry you will have to have registers, cleaning, checklists, monitors, and audit checklist would be there. CSSD registers, you're going to tell the batch, load, items, expiry, the QCs it's passed, etc. Dispatch, and whenever you have content, etc. Right? Now going to the uh, HIC 2A, this is very, very simple. This is something that supports the program. So what you saw first was all that that's in the manual that need to be done. And here is something that you need to do, uh, need, need to have to support the entire program. So hand washing facilities are available. That's HIC 2A. HIC 2B says gloves, masks, soaps and disinfectants are available and used correctly. Whenever you say use correctly, that's again meaning you need to monitor it. How can you monitor? You need to monitor by having a checklist. So uh, I always say, give them um, a mock material, ask them to wear, show them during when they come for an induction training, show them how to use it with a checklist and say, this is how you need to, and this is how I'm going to capture you know, your process. So they know this, you know, for those who are from teaching institutions would be very familiar with this, the OSPI and their checklist for OSPI, etc. So similar to that is what you would do. So you do uh, whether they've done them and then you see which are the areas they have missed and go back and tell them. There is no, um, there is no um, use to the audits or monitoring uh, checklist if you have not conveyed to the person concerned what has happened because your feedbacks are most important for them to correct nobody is doing anything because they want to do it and do an error they have they have learned it a particular way and that's why they're doing it so it's important that you get this right then the hic2c looks at appropriate pre and post exposure prophylaxis is provided to all concerned staff members so this is pretty much a simple one which just supports the entire program so cleaning one's hand to prevent the spread of infection is hand hygiene. You could do a hand washing or hand rubbing. Okay, you can use a hand sanitizer to hand rub or a, hand, or a gel or hand washing with soap and water whenever it's visibly soiled. When the hands are visibly soiled, never a hand rub. Okay, and also whenever you have a, a patient that you suspect to have a spore forming pathogens, um, you know, cause, causing um, infection in this particular category of patient, for example, Clostridium difficile. So in such situations, it's best to use the soap and water and never a hand rub. So also is the facilities. Facilities for hand washing is something that an assessor would look at. And it's important for us to see and make it available. People don't wash hands is our complaint. But have we made the uh, required facilities for them to wash hands? Do we have wash basins? Do we have hands free or elbow free? Uh, sorry, elbow operated or, you know, sensor operated or foot operated so that, you know, your hands which are soiled are not touching 
and leaving the organism on the taps for the next person to touch. Okay, adequate water and soap is available. Sometimes you also need to know whether there may be some people who may be allergic to the chemicals that are being used. So it's important to check that as well. Facilities for drying hands without containing either a single-use towel or it could be a tissue or it could be a you know automatic hand dryer, etc. So and it's also important where are you placing it. So in critical care areas, it's important to place in every cot and in, in general areas, at least in every third or fourth cot, so that you know it's been used. Sometimes there is the fear that the patient's attendant uses more, and that's my experience as well. So then the healthcare worker, but it is important that you ensure people, the healthcare worker is um, um, uh, you know decontaminating hands between patient care, and it's important. Now, when are they supposed to? Um, do a hand hygiene again this is very much a common slide that everybody uh, is very aware of so i'm just quickly going to take it to all the five of them before touching a patient after touching a patient before any clean or aseptic procedure after a blood and body fluid exposure i'm going one four two and three um, and the fifth one is these you know patient surroundings which is you remember the high touch points where they are frequently touching that is a site you need to clean more often when they touch you need to wash your hands more often so you need to uh, teach and train them so that they perform appropriate technique, use the um, um, right uh, uh, hand sanitizing uh, ingredient and the time duration because a casual hand washing may leave certain areas as you would see in the most frequently missed one marked red here, right? So they are the ones which are frequently missed and so you can have a six steps of hand washing, seven steps of hand washing, five steps of hand washing, whatever, but you need to cover those areas which were missed out by a casual hand washing, right? So palm to palm, palm over the dorsum, you know, interlacing, interlocking, thumb rotating, and, you know, rubbing the palms with your uh, fingertips so that it covers your tips, the nail beds, the inter, inter digits, your, the palma surface, the, the dorsum, and as well as your, your um, thumbs. Right. So the time also is important. How long you give this friction? Okay, 20 to 30 seconds if it's a hand rub and washing 40 to 60 seconds. If it's a surgical hand wash, routine would be two minutes. If it's a procedure like a cardiothoracic or when there's an implant procedure, long extended procedures, it's good to wash for five to eight minutes as well. That's what the WHO says. Right. So these are hand hygiene uh, audit tools, which is from the 2009 WHO hand hygiene um, uh, toolkit so you can just take them you capture uh, the the moments whether they have whether they've done whether they've done the steps appropriately have they used appropriate sanitizing agent and have they whether they use the gel and the uh, and uh, or the rub and the soap appropriately and the time duration so these things you need to capture and this audit uh, finding is a very very important one one of the quality indicators as well so it's good to capture and see where you are to where you want to be so if you capture the competence where you see which step are they missing out so then you will be able to teach and train exactly that particular area that you need to address use of ppe <clears throat> It's to protect anybody from blood and body fluid exposure or spills, and that's important. These are the various PPs. I, I think uh, post COVID, I think less um, we need to know this because um, I mean, not less to need already aware. But the sequence of donning um, is you know, your boots first, okay, and then your sorry, Are you able to see. Oh, I'm so sorry. The boots first, your gowns next, then your surgical um, mask, and then your visors, then your gloves. So in your removing also would be your gloves first, and your uh, eye visors or goggles, then your gown, then your surgical mask um, or your respirator, and then finally your boots. So it's dependent also on 
if you are in the in in the covid wards and you are wearing two gloves then you'll be one earlier and one later so accordingly so you have your checklist made and then see so teach and train people on the donning doffing i would say you need to have um, a, um, an additional separate kit kept you know for teaching and training staff so this would be used exclusively for teaching and training and um, you know um, that you can uh, use more often so that you know they they are aware of that yeah so the other is your um, preventing needle stick injury so you need to tell them that they have to be careful while handling needles scalpels or any sharp items like the lancet or you know the broken glass etc anything um, uh, and they need to know how to dispose the needles appropriately never bend break or recap needles if recap need to be done it need to be by the one handed scoop method or technique that need to be taught or trained again okay important to vaccinate people for hepatitis b that's a basic requirement of course you need to do a risk assessment kind of person where are they working what is the what is the risk for various infections they would have so you can add other than hepatitis b to them also for example in a patient per staff who is working in the icu and going to be handling more more um, uh, you know uh, patients with um, Flu or chicken pox, the COVID, etc. So you need to be protecting or equipping them with those. So therefore, you need to additionally vaccinate those working in the ICUs, the emergencies, the isolation wards, etc. With you know chicken pox vaccine or influenza vaccine or you know COVID vaccine. Um, housekeeping staff must be vaccinated with hepatitis B and TT. Food handlers with salmonella vaccine as well. So and these records need to be maintained. Very important and. And uh, three doses of uh, uh, vaccination, zero, one, and six months for hepatitis B. On the seventh month, it's a good practice to do the anti-HBS titers. And titers, more than 10 international units, is protective. So that's important for us to document and see. Suppose if it's a lab staff or dialysis unit staff, etc., it's a mandate that they need to have their titers documented as well. So it's important for that category if, you know, if uh, money, is a, money is an issue in the center. Right. Post exposure prophylaxis, depending on the type of exposure, you know, you have a exposure code and the status code of uh, the person. So you will identify for HIV, hepatitis B, CV. Um, you will see the post exposure prophylaxis, document the exposure, do a proper root cause analysis. And you also be, teach and train people how they can protect themselves with an expo from exposures. It could be a mucocutaneous exposure or a percutaneous exposure. So you need to be careful. And this uh, documentation of baseline testing and the um, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis given to them, monitoring their uh, in, uh, taking these um, post-exposure prophylaxis as well. All of these are um, very important and that has to be documented by the infection control nurses and processed. I still remember putting it on um, a whiteboards where we um, where we add people um, when they have a uh, exposure and then we erase out the people when we have done them for uh, for having monitored them for almost a six months period so a baseline six weeks six months uh, three months and six months is what we would want to look at their their uh, tests as well and then so it's important that you follow up these these uh, healthcare workers and um, also for their post-exposure prophylaxis. Should not stop these prophylaxis only for HIV, HPV, uh, HC, etc. You need to also for, for um, you know, diphtheria or uh, cholera or um, flu, etc. So wherever there is a post-exposure prophylaxis required, you need to document them and have them. So this is the last one. It's a very quick one. This is HIC3, which looks at biomedical waste management practices are followed. There are five objective elements. The first one is it is authorized by prescribed authority for management and handling of biomedical waste. The prescribed authority is the pollution control board, the state central guided guiding the state control pollution control board, and that is through the Ministry of Forestry, Forest, uh, um, Environment, and Climate Change. So that from there to the central board and then the state board then that would be the one which you would which would guide you through on so you need to have um, been authorized authorized personnel so you need to have applied for saying that we as a hospital are going to be generating waste so we would be segregating them transporting them and you know storing them for a defined period of time and then sending for sending it for final treatment and disposal so this permission has to be sought based on the number of beds you have and the type of activity that you do 
The HIC 3B looks at proper segregation and collection of biomedical waste from all patient care areas, and it is implemented and monitored. Please remember, whenever it is monitored, that means there is an audit that's required or a follow-up by somebody, you know, lo looking at whether it is done properly is done. The ideal would be an infection control nurse. Others could also do that. HIC 3C looks at biomedical waste treatment facility. That is a third party who takes waste from our facility to finally treat and dispose. So you need to have a, an MOU with them and it, you know that is important. So these, the first 3A and 3C becomes a mandatory or a statutory requirement as well, right? So suppose you have, um, you know, if it's uh, for various reason, if you would want to uh, treat, in, uh, treat the waste in, in, in house, it is allowed, but there are regulations and requirements for that which need to be fulfilled. And for specialized areas which don't come within the 75 kilometers range, etc., it would be still applicable. HIC 3D is the requisite fee that you need to pay, the documents that you need to maintain, and reports that need to be submitted. The reports need to be submitted by the 30th June every every year, the annual report. So there is a web a login and password that's given for every organization. So you just log in and then say, okay, these are the ways that I'm generating in these quantities I'm generating and I have no accidents or incident to report. Accidents are incidents are never the needle stick injury. It is accidental, you know, um, a bomb blast or a fire or a tripping of the waste, etc. So these things, you know, that those not there. So this has to be maintained. The last is the HIC 3E, which looks at appropriate PP need to be wear worn by all categories of uh, staff handling the biomedical waste. So you need to wear, you know, proper PP and they need to be trained at least once a year. So safe disposal of waste, your waste can be the blood and body food secretion, excretions, human waste, lab waste, all of that. It should be as per the guidelines and there should be a proper policy for single use consumables also being disposed. At the site of generation, what should be there? There should be a display of poster very close to the bins. That's a requirement. Discard biomedical waste into appropriate color-coded bins that need to be done and that need to be monitored. Staff generating are responsible for whoever is throwing. Suppose I have swabbed the site for sample collection, then it is my responsibility to dispose. I cannot give it to another person to dispose it. That's important. Then segregation, the staff generating the waste into individual color codes where bags which are color coded so that there is a uniformity, standardization. Nobody needs to open up the waste to see what's inside the waste. And there is a mark and there is a barcode which also tags with the GPS of the transporting vehicle for the third party. So this will help us in, in you know shifting the waste without getting pilferage at any point from the time of its collection from the organization or the hospital to the treatment facility for its final treatment and disposal. Now, who's going to monitor this process? The infection control nurses. If there are any deviation, corrective actions need to be done, right? So then you would have a temporary storage area within the hospital demarcated very away from the routine trafficking of patients and healthcare workers within the hospital. So it has to be in an area reached by the third party who takes waste from the facility, but it has to be you know away from the routine. Uh, area. So it has to be color coded from the time it is segregated. It needs to be color coded, whether it is the transporting trolley, which is covered and transported in color coded segregated areas and stored also in color coded segregated rooms or areas in that area. It need not be a big room. Can be a small facility. Some some the organization are fantastic or very beautiful uh, facilities, very small cupboard like things where they store and easy for people to come and take the waste also. Transport biomedical waste. Uh, to the storage area in closed containers only ensure that it is, it is clean and protected availability of a hand washing facility and trolley wash facility available you have to have to follow the covid uh, waste guidelines if it is with um, hospital or if you're generating waste uh, from patients who are test positive for covid or you're handling patients with covid transportation send waste to the treatment facility within 48 hours from the time it is thrown. For example, if I'm throwing this as a waste now, at this point at it's four, and it, in, in tomorrow, today after 3.59, the next, uh, next day, and in 48 hours, it should not be there in the same area. It needs to be out of the hospital in 48 hours. Transported safely in, in a safe manner and use proper vehicles to transport it. Weigh the waste. You have to weigh the waste at the site where it is generated 
as the site where it is stored temporarily in the hospital or the organization, and also in the common treatment facility or the person who takes the waste. So the difference between the first and the second will tell the pilferage what is happening within the organization of the hospital. The second and third would tell us the pilferage that's happening by the third party. So this is only to you know to prevent people to misuse or you know these waste which is uh, getting generated. Right. So document the time of collection and then quantity of waste. So this is the segregation general waste in green and then infected plastic or contaminated plastic in red, which includes your urine bags, your catheters, tubes, etc., your vacuum containers, etc. The infected waste goes into the yellow, which would have the tissue waste. It can also have the placenta, the diapers, sanitary napkins, etc. Also would have um, the bl blood bags, which needs to be autoclaved and disposed along with the microbiology and biotechnology waste. Then the chemicals also go into the waste in, in the yellow, but it, it goes with a symbol C instead of the biohazard symbol. And cytotoxic waste need to be bagged separately. If there is a cytotoxic waste generated in an oncology ward, all waste generated through the process of preparation, the PPE that's used, the tubings that are there, the collected vials, all of that would be bagged into a single yellow bag, which is marked C. And except for the needle, which goes into the sharps container, everything else bagged and documented in a register. It has to be disposed. It has to be taken up by the by the person who's delivering the cytotoxic drug becomes it's his responsibility to finally treat and dispose. Glass and metals goes into blue punch proof container. No more is it the cardboard box from 2018 onwards. It is blue punch proof container, which is covered. Then white punch proof container is for the sharps, which is needles, you know, the blades, scalpels, um, you know, lancets, etc. And if it's a fixed, if it's a syringe with a fixed needle, it goes into the white. So never mix, um, fill waste more than three fourth, and these things need to be audited. So this is the audit forms. It's just a simple audit form. You can or you can prepare your own forms. Uh, this is just an example to show how these audit forms are. You need to have the name of the auditor, the date, and the time, and the area that has been audited, and have to score them. S is one, and no is zero, and it can be not applicable or any. So why you would want to score that? Because you, when you give the values, like I mentioned earlier, you need to know where you are now and where you would want to go. So further, it, with, because when you do an intervention, you will be able to see whether it has become better. So what was 40% adherence initially has now become 60% or 60 has become 80, et cetera. So it's important to have these audit forms and have the numbers made. Okay, so what are the points to remember in the biomedical waste, which is a five important objective elements, which is obtaining the license for generating waste, having an MOU with a third party, submitting the Farm 4, which is the annual report of the Pollution Control Board every June 30th, not every June 30th, before every th June 30th. Then renewal of the authorization should not start. Suppose I, my, uh, my authorization expires on the 1st of April, I should not start from the 31st or the 1st of April. Okay, I should start three months earlier because I need to give the time for processing so that I'm never in a period without the authorization. So that's important. Submit incident and accident reports to the PCB. Any hospital with more than 30 beds need to have a um, biomedical waste committee, which meets at least once in every six months. Okay, and, doc and, and discusses about the waste so that every time there is a there is a discussion on how to reduce, recycle or, or reuse waste uh, in, in a way that it does not affect the system. Right. It's also a good practice to go and visit the treatment facility once in every six months to see whether the waste that you're generating from your hospital, you're sending it to these treatment facility, thinking that they would do what is required to do and are they doing it as appropriately as required? Is your is your documentation of the weights of values matches with that of the treatment facility? So that is what is required. Okay. So what's the point to remember? Wear PPE, wash hands, okay, and use um, uh, you know, uh, be familiar with the biohazards, etc. You, know, you wear your PPEs appropriately. At least once a year need to be um, trained. <clears throat> uh, there should be a training for the healthcare workers, specifically the housekeeping staff, need to be vaccinated against hepatitis B and tetanus as well. Right. So we've come to the end, and that's the summary of today's um, session. Uh, we've started with this slide again. So this is the fifth chapter, the most important chapter of the of any any um, accreditation system, because this is one something that all the hard works done by every other should not be lost to a poor infection control practices. Right. So the HIC has three standards with thirteen objective elements 
HIC-1 has infection control, and the uh, HIC-1 focuses on the infection control manual. The HIC-2 looks at the support system for the infection control practices, and HIC-3 looks at the biomedical waste management completely. So the first one has five objective elements, the last one has five objective elements, and the one in between has three objective elements. Thank you so much for your patient uh, hearing, and uh, it was wonderful interacting with you. I, I hope I was I was audible to all of you. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to take. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Jay Lakshmi. It was excellent and so informative. You for those, okay, for the question asked on urine decontamination, yes, you need to. Liquid waste needs to be decontaminated with 1% sodium hypochlorite minimum 30 minutes before it gets into the ETP or STP plant. Okay, so um, then the often, other. Okay, sorry. How often to review infection control manual? Once a year, it would be ideal. I think we started with that, isn't it? So yeah, the more right. often you would do is better. Amendments you can add as, as often as you require to be. Sometimes amendments are made following an internal audit or an external audit or change of solutions, change of practices, etc. Please include them. Sometimes what was outsourced earlier has now become an activity of the organization. So that would become also. So, But when you're looking at your uh, manual, look at it completely and see what you need to. What I showed in the manual, the first one, of course, I did not spend a little bit more time on that that's the ncdc document just go to the website you will see this infection control manual that the ncdc website would have so the ministry of health family welfare you could download it's a very simple document 2020 uh, document and you can use that for preparing your own yeah yeah it can be shared yeah definitely, definitely. and how to disinfect a dialysis machine Okay, disinfecting a dialysis machine would be an, a, a, the whole process, but you know, the, the dialysis machine, depending on which part of the dialysis machine, okay, simple outside would require only an alcohol to be cleaning the surfaces. But if you're looking at the tubing and internally, okay, it's, it depends on, you know, your process of running them through, okay? Uh, so you, you will, um, I, I, I think I will just text that with you with the process and the steps in the entire process of disinfecting between two patient care uh, for your uh, dialysis unit. Okay. okay. And I think you already spoke about they just uh, What about reusable policy in the theater for all the reusable device for, so you need to have a defined policy for your reuse um, and so which are the instruments that you are going to be reusing more than one time but please remember the manufacturer says one time you cannot use more than one but for various reasons you can you you will be but it has to be as good as the first one so your decontamination and sterilization process should be robust that it does not damage it at the same time, uh, you know, makes it all all good for it to be used. But you have to define based on, um, you know, some guidelines uh, that uh, would help you and also with the uh, consensus with the clinicians who are going to use it. Identify the times and ensure that uh, it is not going to be used more than that number of times. After taking a consent from a patient, that is when you can use it on any patient. If you are going to use a reusable device on me, I need to know that you are going to use, you are you are going to do that. So I I have to be uh, be aware of that. So that's important. Yeah. Okay. And standard guidelines are there for the testing index of microbial air contamination and OTs. Yeah, there are, but I think it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah, so, so so the environmental uh, in, environmental um, uh, decont I mean um, surveillance itself it looks at a lot of things. Um, no accreditation process. Again, I would say this: no accreditation process asks you to swab sites and see whether it is good or bad. Nowhere does it ask for. So it is only to see whether your your engineering controls within the facility is doing good and your practices are good your cleaning is all good this is all it's it's going to make you feel kind okay so there are um, for example if you're going to put a settle plate in in areas so there is some defined numbers where if you're just putting a settle plate for you know one one by one by one is the uh, was the criteria where you keep a settle plate of 90 centimeters um, sorry 9 centimeters or 90 millimeters plate for one hour exposure at a height, uh, you know, uh, one feet, um, sorry, one meter away from the uh, floor and the wall for one hour of exposure, such a, such a plate, uh, you should not have more than five colony forming units in a place where there are no human activity at that point of time, like a theater where it's closed and after your procedure. But when there is an activity, you cannot have more than 25 colony forming units. If this is if you're using this so but if you're using a air sampler the numbers would be 
35 coliforming unit or 180 coliforming unit before or after. So there are certain numbers to this and calculations can be made even if you have a larger size plate or num the time that you have defined to expose is lesser, etc. And your uh, you, your incubation also would be different when you are keeping a blood plate for, for bacteria to that of a for looking at fungus also. If you're keeping for fungus, you need to keep it for longer. So these are some small things, of course, yeah. um, each one would need to be looked at. Okay, next one seems very, I think most hospitals or nursing homes, they have this. How to discard the live vaccines, especially, you know, some expiry date would have been there, but what to do with them? How to discard those? Okay, so... Um, so this this would be uh, this would be um, uh, something like a gray <clears throat> gray area. So um, either it goes into because they say okay it's a vial which is uh, you know ex uh, expired. So therefore it goes here. But I would say it goes into the yellow. Better if you would autoclave and dispose it. That will be the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that will be the. <clears throat> Uh, best way to dispose this, just like the microbiology and biotechnology ways that you would handle. So that is how you can do that. Yeah, and I think I really have to thank you, uh, Dr. J. J. Lakshmi. To thank, you, thank you, Thank you, Thank you very much. Happy.